Spiritual does not mean looking up, looking down. It is just that you have realized that what you gather is not you. Not just intellectually, experientially you know that what is you and what is not you is clear to you now. Once you know that you are a dimension beyond your physical nature, you are a limitless possibility. Question of being peaceful and joyful is not even an issue. I'll leave it here if you have questions, any kind of question, please. Can we take questions from here only? Please, please send uh, them on a slip. As uh, we can see, uh, I have already got a lot many questions. The audience is getting eager to say, have a lot many doubts uh, solved by Sadhguru. I am getting them through slips, I am getting through my WhatsApp, I am getting through SMSs. Uh, so without wasting any further time, I would like to take some questions uh, for Sadhguru, though we have a say, time limitation, so I don't know how many I will be able to fill up. But uh, the very first question is from uh, chairperson of IMA, uh, Mrs. Ritu Grover, what is the purpose of life? What is it that one feels fulfilled uh, with the way he or she has, uh, when it is that one feels fulfilled uh, with the way he or she has lived the life? What is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of life? <sighs> well, uh, suppose today you are ecstatic for something, for whatever reason. When you're ecstatic, do you wonder what is the purpose of life? Do you? Do you? No. When life is becoming burdensome, then you ask what is the purpose of life, isn't it? So all questions which come from any kind of burdensomeness, desperation, misery, don't try to answer those questions because you will get wrong answers from within and wrong answers from anybody else. People will tell you the purpose of life is uh, because God has fixed this and that. I want you to know in such a huge creation, maybe they don't even know that you exist, be ready for that. Don't know. If you, if you have a family of four people, you don't know what the hell is happening. Yes or no? If you have two children, you don't know what the hell they're doing most of the time. So you think somebody knows who you are and he's got a special purpose for you? This is unfortunately, in the name of religion this is spread, this is the height of human ego. This is too self-centered. First of all to think that existence is human-centric itself is a wrong idea. You're just one more creature, just understand this. You're just one more creature in the creation, don't make too much out of yourself. It's a tremendous possibility, that's different, but do not make too much out of yourself. What is the purpose of life? Never ask… You, what you're asking is why creation? Never ask why with creation. You just ask how. If you ask me how to transcend this burdensomeness, I've got a way for you, I've got a method for you, I have tools and technologies for you. If you ask me how to transcend my misery, I've got ways and tools and technologies for you. If you ask me how to live in such a way that this life finds its fullness, we've got ways and means and technologies. But if you ask why, there is no why. We can tell you stories. I can tell you… Shall I tell you the real story? Why creation? You want to know. One day God was playing marbles and one marble jumped up like this and became planet Earth. So he shot some more, nine, ten more and it became solar system. Shall I continue? This is a ridiculous story but <laughs> I can tell you… Uh, I can tell you a little more serious story that many of you would love to believe. You need to understand this. If right now, if I speak about something which is not yet in your experience, you have only two choices, either to believe me or to disbelieve me. If you believe me, you will not get any closer to reality. If you disbelieve me, you will not get any closer to reality. It is just that you will either have a positive story to tell or a negative story to tell. 
Stories are good solace, but never a solution. You must, you must decide in your life, are you looking for solace or are you looking for a solution? If you're looking for solace, I will tell you a nice story, not the marble story. I can make better stories than that. But if you're looking for a solution, then never ask beyond your present level of experience because you will be forced to either believe me or disbelieve me. It will not solve anything for you. So why creation? Never ask. Ask how to navigate through this creation. We'll show you ways. Never ask why because then we will have to go into a dimension which is not yet in your experience which will force you to believe and disbelieve. Sadhguru, uh, Mrs. Rachna Mittal is having a very simple question and she asked, Sadhguruji, is being happy so really difficult that it needs to be managed? <laughs> uh, being happy is not difficult, but unfortunately most people don't manage it <laughs> because they think it's going to happen to them. When you're five years of age, you're quite happy, isn't it? Yes or no? I want you to go home and see one of your pictures when you're five, it was like this. Now it's becoming like this. When you're five years of age, if you're so happy, by the time you're thirty, you should have been ecstatic, if you had grown, I mean. But by the time they're thirty, most people are… mess themselves up in so many different ways. This is not because there is some difficulty with life or happiness, it is just that, as I told you, they gave you a sharp knife. You don't have a steady enough hand. If you had a steady hand, the sharp knife would be a wonderful instrument. If you don't have a steady hand, you keep cutting yourself and now being happy when a knife is constantly cutting into you is not… is very difficult for sure, yes? How many times has it happened to you in the last twenty-five years that it so happened somebody put a knife into you? Not happened for most of you. If it happened to one or two people, I'm sorry. Even nobody even put a pin into you, isn't it? Yes or no? I'm asking how many times it so happened from external sources suffering came to you? No, you're mostly in self-help. Yes or no? You're in self-help, isn't it? You don't need anybody's help, you're such an expert. Sometimes when I see people, I think they're training to get employment in hell or something. They're practicing here because they are so good at self-torture, they may be good at torturing other people. So happiness is neither easy nor difficult because there is no states like this. This is happiness, this is unhappiness. You are slipping between this and that any moment, isn't it? Yes or no? It's not like there is a capsule of happiness and a capsule of unhappiness and they are separate. No, it is all intermingling one moment like this, one moment like this, in the same situation one moment joyful, one moment miserable, another moment some other way, is it not happening? So it, these are not anything, this is just this. You are a volatile being right now, not stable enough. I told you this evolutionary problem. Your intellect and your awareness evolved ahead of your physiology. You're only 1.23 percent away from a chimpanzee, but in intelligence you are big away. Now your own intelligence turning against you, one simple way of being happy is you go for a lobotomy. You know what this is? Remove half of your brain. You'll always be like that. So it's easy. It's not easy, it's not difficult. Should it be managed? You don't have to manage happiness. You must learn to manage your faculties. You… the only thing is just this, people are suffering two most important faculties of your mind, your memory and your imagination, which sets you apart from every other creature. What happened fifty years ago, you can still remember, which no other creature on this planet can probably, distinctly, and you can project into what may happen in the next hundred years. 
is memory and imagination are two basic faculties which makes us human and on top of the evolutionary pile. This is what people are suffering. What happened ten years ago, they are still suffering. What may happen day after tomorrow, they are already suffering. This is not that they are suffering life, they are just suffering their memory and their imagination. So happiness, don't aim at happiness, just look at yourself. How what you call as myself is being conducted. If you conduct it, if you know how to conduct it the way you want it, you will be blissed out. Yes, it is not being conducted. So th happiness and misery is happening by accident. Somebody else can cause happiness to you. Somebody else can cause misery to you. People ask me, Sadhguru, have you, or we have been with you for twenty-five years, we've never seen you angry, do you ever get angry? You want it? <laughs> Do I look like somebody who is incapable of something like that? If you want, I'll give you. It's just that I have not given this privilege to anybody, that somebody can make me angry, somebody can make me unhappy, somebody can make me happy. No, I kept these things to myself. <laughs> you must keep it to yourself too. It must be… the best hands are you, isn't it? Yes? Your joy and misery must be in your hands, isn't it? If you choose to be miserable, be… I'm not against it. But what you want should be happening within you, not otherwise, isn't it? Uh, and then I have probably a sequel to this question. This is through WhatsApp. And somebody wants to know, uh, Sadhguru, how can one be happy even if he or she is married? <laughs> we already went through this. Marriage is supposed to be about multiplying your joy. If it's about multiplying your misery, we should not. There was a time in this country where <clears throat> seventy percent of the population went into what is called as grihastha or the married life, thirty percent went into ascetic life. Because for a whole lot of people, whatever their physical and emotional needs are a passing need, they don't have to mortgage their whole life into that. For some people it's strong, they can't live without it, they must. It's not a question of right and wrong, it's not a question of what is superior and inferior, it's a question of what is suitable for you. Today we have created a thing that everybody must marry, so there are lots of people who should not have married who are in it and asking these kind of questions <laughs> There are many people for whom the need for the opposite sex is just a passing need. If they simply close their eyes for a few months, it'll be gone for them, it'll never come back. But they get into this pact. Now, once you marry, at least till now… Sadhguru, what is your take on corruption in the country? And what do businessmen do… Uh, what do businessmen do not follow suit if it is a way of life? There is no corruption in this country. Who said there is corruption in this country? There is no corruption in this country. It is daylight robbery. It's banditry. They <laughs> corruption… <laughs> corruption means you want some favor, you go to him with great hesitation, under the table, he takes something from you. That's corruption. Now they're pointing a gun at your head and say, you pay otherwise you won't exist. This is banditry, this is not corruption. We have to deal with this. If you don't deal with this, if you don't deal with this one fundamental thing, we will not go very far as a nation, we cannot go. Because there is a government and a parallel government, there is a rule and a parallel rule. Parallels are… people when… normally when they use this analogy of being parallel lines, people think that they are together. No, I want you to understand, if you are going criss-cross, you may meet somewhere. Parallel lines will never meet. 
So, this parallel economy, this parallel set of rules for everything, you know the laws of the land and you must know the laws of, uh, you know, the underhand stuff. Otherwise, you can't run a business. With parallel lines, you will not go very far. This nation cannot go far, okay? At a certain stage in our development of this nation, so many things have happened. We don't have to look at it morally. I want you to look at it practically. If it goes like this, we can't get very far. For this, instead of talking about corruption and anti-corruption movements and people trying to make a life out of anti-corruption movements, instead of that, what we need to look at is our rules, especially the rules of mayor doing business, Hello. Are too ambiguous. Nobody understands what the hell these rules are, okay? It's written one inside the other in such a way. I was, uh, you know, <laughs> when I was, uh, when I was trying to get my, I already have a FAA license in America, but I'm trying to get a license here. Get, just get endorsed by DGCA. And the goddamn thing that things that they're telling me, these rules were made before Wright brothers, all right? <laughs> I, I, I meet the person who is the head of DGC and I ask him, sir, do you, do you understand these rules? I know how to fly a goddamn thing, but I don't understand these rules, do you? He says, no, I, I am not a pilot, I don't understand. I'm telling you, nobody understands because it's written in such a way that you're not supposed to understand. When you don't understand a damn thing, you'll pay something and get it, all right? The rules are written in such ambiguous ways, it's time to simplify the laws of doing business. It's most important. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I don't know how it is here, I hear uh, things are much better here now with uh, your chief minister and in the center it's getting better. A few states are getting better, but where we are, if you want to get a building permission, <laughs> we're not building a commercial building, ashram building, all right. We know everybody from top to bottom, it takes fourteen months to get a building permission. It has to go through some sixteen different departments and at every table you have to move it. There must be a team following this files where it goes, otherwise they'll vanish somewhere. Uh, we're building another ashram in the United States. There is a code book that you are supposed to understand and your architect is supposed to understand and you discuss it with the local authority and then you build. Nobody bothers what the hell you're building. You build whatever you want. Before you occupy, he comes for inspection. If it is according to the code, you, your building is there. If it is not according to the code, your building will go down and you go in. As simple as that. Why this? Why is it that we're treating every ordinary citizen, a law-abiding citizen, like a criminal? You have to get no objection and no objection. Why the hell does anybody have objection with my money if I'm building this nation? Why does anybody have a damn objection with my money I'm building something in this nation that's going to be useful for the people, whether it's a business or an industry or an ashram, it doesn't matter what. I am building something with my investment and building the nation. What is your problem? Why, why do you have an objection? Are you still English? Are you still an occupier? We are still continuing those laws. It's time we change the laws. If you simplify the laws, nobody have to pay anything. In simplification of the laws, there are complications. Some misuse will happen, but it's okay misuse, as little misuse for some time till we understand how it works is all right rather than holding the nation at a standstill. I think that the time permits, we can take two more questions at this juncture. Uh, Swamiji, uh, I'm getting one question from say lot many peoples having the say, same kind of issue. Uh, it has been sent by Mr. Alok Jain of IMA. The same question has some, been raised some by... Some young people are shouting out questions. I think we should take one from the gallery. Okay. Uh, can, can, you, can you just write it down and send to me? Okay. But right now I'm having one question from this Mr. Vatan Bhati and uh, Mr. Alok Jain. Both are having more or less same kind of issue. And they say, whenever we hear great personalities, we get inspired. 
but that inspiration goes off very fast. <laughs> How to keep that inspiration permanently? <laughs> now, uh, if you're just getting influenced by somebody's talk, it's not good enough. You have to take some concrete steps. So, I'm not here to just inspire you. I think everything that I'm saying is little depreciative of many things that you're doing, not very inspiring, isn't it? I'm telling you, if you are interested in your life, if you're interested, are you? Is your life the most precious life in your life? It is. The, you have to pay a little more attention to this. Life is not accessories. When, I, when most people say life, they're talking about their work, their career, their wife, their husband, their children, their home, their car. No, these are accessories of life. In all these accessories, you missed out what is life. What is life is what's happening here within this, isn't it? Yes or no? Paying attention to life, life per se, not the things around you. What kind of arrangements you make, it's your choice. Somebody wants to live in a small hut on the mountain, somebody wants to live in a palace, it's their choice. I'm not… I don't want to interfere with the arrangements of your life. You make whatever kind of arrangements seem sensible to you. Don't try to make arrangements that somebody else is making. Make the kind of arrangements which make sense to you, it's fine. But this life needs more attention. How this works? What is the basis of this? Where does this come from? Where does this go? What is the nature of my existence? Only if you grasp this, you can conduct your life consciously. Otherwise, only by accident, isn't it? When you conduct your life by accident, then once in a way when somebody speaks, you will go up and when they leave, they will go down. This is exactly what I'm talking. This is exactly what I'm saying. Many times even bullshit gets you to the top, but it doesn't let you stay there, all right? Whatever anybody speaks, doesn't matter what they speak, whatever anybody speaks, till it becomes a living reality for you, it's just a lot of bull, isn't it? So I'm talking about not a philosophy, not an ideology, not even a teaching, I'm talking about simple methods, simple technologies that you can employ. You try and see, if it works, let's do it, if it doesn't work, throw it away, we'll try some other tool. Simple methods to fix this the way you want it. So don't get inspired by me. Do not get inspired by me, inspiration is not the intention of this. What the intention of this is to tell you that as there is a science and technology for external well-being, there is a whole science and technology for inner well-being. It is just that anything beyond survival will not enter your life unless you strive for it. Say for example, you know, when you were three, four years of age, the dam A, hmm, what a complicated mess it was and there were two versions, you had to write hundred times to get it, Yes or no? Today you can close your eyes and write it. See, but those who did not strive for it, even today they cannot write, isn't it? So something as simple as that has taken a lot of striving, isn't it? So similarly, anything which is beyond your survival, what is survival will come to you naturally. What is beyond survival, some striving is needed. It's not happened because there is no striving. Striving has not happened because there is not enough infrastructure, both human and otherwise. See, for example, <clears throat> you know in, uh, in India also the attempt is happening a big way. I was just looking at this aspect. In, in uh, 1870, 93 percent of the American population was illiterate, 93. Today, hundred percent, not literacy, education, everybody can read and write. How does this happen? School rooms, enough infrastructure has been built, enough teachers have been produced and that's why it's happening. There was a time in this land, there is enough infrastructure for inner well-being of the human being. Tell me where is it now? We are building cinema theaters, we are building hospitals, we are building schools. Have we built anything for the inner well-being of the human being? Have we done anything? about this? Have the, are the parents doing anything about it? Teachers doing anything about it? No. 
only now small because uh, well, you know like uh, economic success is bringing pain to people now they're looking at it when i say now they're looking at it do you do not do it doesn't matter in your life if you do not do what you cannot do that's not a issue but if you do not do what you can do you're a tragic life I will say uh, combine few portions again which are having the same tone. Lot many people wants to ask about say contradiction between my inner self and somebody else inner self. Oh. <laughs> Professor Atwati from Medicaps Institute of Technology and Management, Dr. Alok Bansal and Mr. Jagdish Valma from IMA uh, all are having more or less same kind of query. Uh, they, uh, they write, Swamiji, I want to be myself in control of my inner self but I live with my family and friends and next generation who all have their own inner self. This calls for compromises every day. Then how to take care of such situation to realize myself as I want to be? I think we've been through this, but anyway, let me repeat this. See, right now, you're calling your personality as self. Your personality is an acquired quality largely unconscious, a little bit of it conscious. Your body is an acquired thing. Your mind or the content of your mind is acquired thing. So what is not acquired from outside, only that you can call a self. In that, there is no such thing as myself and yourself. It's like this, let me give you an analogy. It's like, you have, when you were a child at least, did you blow some soap bubbles? Oh, you did not. Oh, yes, sir. If you blow soap bubbles, they're all real, isn't it? So there is a bubble. What is the most important aspect of the bubble? The air inside, isn't it? If it goes poop, then there's just a spot of water on the floor or soap water on the floor. But the air, where did it go? You don't find it anywhere. But the most important aspect of the bubble is the air that it contains. Similarly, you made a bubble built out of this, from this planet, you picked up material and built something for yourself, fine, I have nothing against it, but to, to gather this much body and to gather this much mind, there must be something more fundamental, don't jump into conclusions, but there must be something more fundamental than that, isn't it? So, the physical body and the mind is just software and hardware for the life within you to function. You gathered your software and hardware from outside, but the life within is undeniably there. To do a simple process, can you see me all of you? You close your eyes, can you see me? No. So now, when you're looking at me, are you looking at me or is it your eyes looking at me? Your eyes must. If you close your eyes, are you still there? Are you still there or are you gone? You're still there. So, your eyes are just a window. If you open the window, you see. If you close the window, you don't see. But you are still there, isn't it? So, whatever that is, let's not give it a name. Right now, we'll call it you. That is not different from you and me. It's fundamental life-making material. This is not different. Right now, if you... What did you have for breakfast, ma? Breakfast. Okay. Huh? What? Milk. This is something more interesting. This is child's food. <laughs> okay, even if you drank milk or you ate a banana, if you eat a banana, this banana goes into you in these two hours, it becomes a woman. Yes or no? If a man eats it, it becomes a man. If a cow eats it, it becomes a cow. There is an intelligence within this which can transform a banana into a human being. Isn't it so? Yes or no? If I take a banana in my hand and make it into a human being, who would you think I am? Creator himself, isn't it? Nothing less than that. And every one of you have this competence or no? Yes or no? You have it, it's only that it is functioning unconsciously, such a phenomena. 
taking a banana and making a human being out of it, is it a small phenomenon? It's a tremendous thing, isn't it? But you're doing it unconsciously. Even, even if a drop of this intelligence enters your life in a conscious manner, suddenly people around you think you are superhuman being. So this is all I am telling you. If you turn inward, this intelligence, this source of creation which can turn a piece of bread into a human being, a banana into a human being exists within you. If you can bring out even a drop in a conscious way, suddenly your life is magical, never miserable again. So when we talk about the self, there is no such thing as yourself and myself, particularly when you're in a teaching faculty, this will happen to you. <laughs> With all due respect, I'm saying, because you stand on a pulpit and slowly you forget who you are. Myself and yourself are two different things. All these others look like aliens actually, because myself. Teaching is a dangerous pro profession because you have a captive audience, understand? <laughs> they are bound there, which is a very dangerous thing because there is no filters for what you think and what you say. People may make fun of you behind you, but in front of you they'll say, okay, because they have to pass the test. It's a very dangerous profession. So don't ever think there is yourself and myself. There is me and you as two different persons. In body we are different, in the content of our mind we are different, in our memories we are different, in our personalities we are different. All this made up by us. But the essential life-making thing which, in, which is within us, which we call as the self or me, in essential me, there is no such thing as you and me. Everybody has the same stuff. That is why I am talking to you. If my stuff was different than you, why the hell will I talk to you? Because anyway it's not possible for you. Yes? <laughs> if it was not possible for you, why will I waste my breath talking to you? Only because you are also made of the same stuff, unrealized. You must understand, in this country always enlightenment has been described as realization, not an achievement, not an accomplishment, just realization. Realization means something that was already there, you just saw. You didn't invent anything, you did not discover anything, you did not make up anything, you did not achieve anything, you just realized that which is already there. So there is no question of myself and yourself. Thank you. Putting an end to the cycle of birth and death. I always insist that you don't believe anything that is not yet your experience. It doesn't matter who says it. This does not mean disbelief. No, you don't know, that's all. Somebody tells you a story, you don't know whether it's true or it's not true. So even if I say something, don't believe this nonsense. The only thing that human beings can do is essentially an expression of who they are. Somebody sings a song, somebody dances, somebody writes a book, somebody paints a picture. Whatever else we do, is an expression of who you are.